Um, thank you for the introduction. This presentation is going to cover um, the uh, topic of small volume parenterals and how they are addressed as combination products in the USA. Um, the topics I'm going to cover are uh, include first why small volume parenterals are combination products in the US. And then the regulatory and testing expectations that you will see in the US, including quality systems and design controls. And then the testing expectations, testing for safety and effectiveness and performance, and also human factors and usability expectations. And then I have a slide on um, some other challenges that um, one might encounter when trying to uh, develop and register small volume parentals in the USA. Um, first, why are small volume parentals combination products in the USA? So it's easy for us to understand that all small volume parentals must be delivered in some manner. Um, they ha you have to get out of the container closure into the body. However, when is it considered a combination product? The FDA first addressed this subject in um, 2013 with regards to pre-filled syringe, syringes in the preamble to the combination product GMP regulation, 21 CFR part four. In that they said, a syringe, however, is not a mere container closure. It's a device used to deliver another medical product. And accordingly, a pre-filled syringe is a combination product and subject to this rule, which was the combination product GMP rule. This was further explained in the draft guidance covering GMP requirements for combination public, uh, products published in 2015. Here, they also included uh, pre-filled syringes, but if the article merely holds a drug, as we are accustomed to in container closures for uh, small parenterals, um, it is merely a container closure. But an article that holds, that contains a drug, but also delivers it may also be a device, in addition to the requirements related to drug containers and enclosures. This whole idea was expanded in the final GMP requirements for combination products in 2017. So this has been evolving for the last eight years. In the, expand, in the final guidance, FDA states elements of container closure systems that are device constituent par parts include piston syringes, metered dose inhalers, and here they added containers for intravenously administered fluids, such as IV bags, which both hold and deliver the drugs or biological products. And they, it, they expanded this to include the fact that these IV bags, which really have no delivery function, are considered as delivering because they are connected to the patient via an IV line. So by extrapolating the definition of a combination product to the IV container via its delivery by a separate approved medical device, FDA opened all primary packaging for small volume parenterals to be considered as combination products that include filled syringes without needles, filled cartridges, and even vials. So recently, FDA has not acknowledged that some parenteral products that are delivered may not be true combination products as codified in the regulations, 21 CFR part three, where combination products are defined. They have begun to use the term combined use products. Now this is not a defined term in any regulation or guidance, but has been informally mentioned and proposed by the Office of Combination Product to apply when a drug requires a device to achieve delivery, which, which as we've already covered, applies to all small volume parenterals. 
So combined use was proposed to describe two separate finished products, a drug and device, that come to the user separately, not packaged together, not co-packaged, that are used together to execute delivery, but are not cross-labeled combination product per the legal defini definition. And these could, con the, these could include one-way labeled products and non-exclusive use products where the device is used for many drugs or the drug may be delivered by many devices, but they are in some way related. They, you need one, at least one of the type of product to deliver the other, or it can, or it can be delivered by multiple products. Now, if it is a combined use product, it may not require implementation of the medical device GMPs as we have gone over, but as we will go over, but can have an impact on the testing and controls required to support development and approval of the small volume parenteral. So the first slides cover a topic that can have a significant impact on many small companies. That is quality systems and design controls. These don't specify any testing, but a company who wants to market a small volume parenteral that is going to be considered a combination product must legally require, uh, uh, comply with 21 CFR part four, which addresses the good manufacturing practices for combination product. Now this regulation outlines a streamlined system to achieve GMP compliance. And so for a company, for most companies that develop small volume parenterals, they already comply with 21 CFR part 210 and 211, which cover a drug GMP system. So additionally, this, reg new, this regulation for combination product requires that they comply with four sections of the medical device GMPs called the quality system regulation or QSR. These are management controls, design controls, purchasing controls, and CAPA. Also, just a note, although the intent will not likely change, it is not clear. FDA proposes to adopt ISO 1345 as a replacement for the QSR, um, and it's not clear how this will directly impact the combination product requirements. So, for a company that has never worked with medical device quality system, implementing design controls is a significant challenge and not to be approached lightly. In fact, most of the testing for some uh, devices like um, pre-filled syringes is already on the radar of all companies developing pre-filled syringes. However, it is the quality systems that is new to them. In these quality systems, design controls are the most difficult. First, GMP controls, these design controls, must start before the product is even designed or developed, which is a concept that is novel to most pharmaceutical development companies and pharmaceutical companies. Usually, GMPs start after you have developed something and you start into manufacturing. Also, for small volume parenterals, most the primary packaging is not designed, but it's chosen and qualified. So you have the challenge of how do you fit the design control requirements to, to address um, a product where you're not designing any of the elements, but you are only choosing those and qualifying those that are already available um, from a, a um, container closure component supplier. But, Regardless, compliant procedures must be generated and the project must contain all of the required elements. So integrated with and parallel to design controls, the company must implement a robust risk management system consistent with ISO 14971. And for most pharmaceutical companies, this is also a novel requirement. And that includes use risk, sometimes called user risk, which is human factors engineering. 
Now, these systems are to cover the final combination product and not necessarily the components, although some of the requirements for the component can, met, can be met by the component um, um, of the uh, or platform supplier. So after you have developed all of your quality systems and you have your procedures in place and you're following your design controls and you've started your risk management, then you need to address what are the expectations for testing. FDA will expect the product to fulfill all requirements necessarily to safely and effectively deliver the small volume parenteral. So by safety, that includes biocompatibility, which is not toxicology and is not extractables and leachables, but is the biocompatibility per the ISO standard 10993 for all direct and indirect patient and user contact materials. It also includes particulates and pyrogens delivered to the patient, which includes drug contact components that are not part of the primary packaging. There are some small volume parenterals that have integrated needles that are not part of the primary packaging and other um, combination products where the, the device itself has a fluid path that is not part of the primary packaging. Uh, sterility of the drug contact components are not part of the primary packaging throughout shipment and storage, which can include package integrity of any sterile barriers other than the, the, the primary packaging. Safety can include exclusion of some materials specific to medical devices like phthalates. Uh, it can include needle, needle safety if implied or claimed by the product which is um, covered by another ISO standard, 23908, and there's an FDA guidance on sharp safety. It can also cover basic electrical and software safety, which must be established if it's applicable, if your primary, if your small volume parenteral contains electronics and software, which is more the case now that we have devices that uh, communicate with an, uh, with an app and are in some way part of the connected community. Safety also includes, very importantly, medicinal product or drug compatibility. So that's defined in ISO 11608-3, which is a, a standard that addresses um, needle-based injection system. It is defined as the evaluation of the medicinal product quality based on combined use with the needle-based injection system. So this is separate from primary packaging testing, including standard drug stability. The focus is on the quality of the drug that is delivered. So it includes the drug which has been exposed to the impact of the conditions of use, which include temperature and time, and the actions experienced by the drug, um, aspiration, reconstitution, manipulation, expulsion, and the impact of drug contact, the contact with the fluid bath once the delivery has started. The contact with materials bring storage is, is, is already addressed in extractables and leachables. However, the, the drug may have contact with materials that are not part of the primary packaging and may in fact um, transmit or impart or in some way elute um, chemicals into the drug during the delivery. Although it may be a short term, it can happen. So effectiveness or performance testing that's required covers all the functions necessary to deliver the drug. These need to be identified and verified or validated. So FDA will suggest, first suggest, and then require that the company identify those that are considered essential performance requirements for the product. Although there's no formal EPR, essential performance requirement definition from FDA, at this point, a guidance is promised. FDA generally considers EPRs as being the performance attributes responsible for the clinical performance of the device at the point of use, dosing, and include the device performance attributes related to the user 
interactions required to administer the dose. And now that's a, a, a concept that is extremely difficult to understand when you're just reading the words or just saying the words. So this was something that, that any manufacturer of an SVP will have an SVP will have to address going on. It is similar to the concept of primary functions, which is defined in the new ISO 11608-1 series published this month or next, um, some re and has some relation to essential performance as, divide, as, de as defined in the IEC requirements for medical electronics, but the concepts are different. The impact of the essential performance requirements is that FDA requires that all of these must be verified during the design at all in-use conditions, after all preconditioning, after shipping simulations, and at the end of expiration. Sometimes they expect these to be tested at worst case conditions. Also, they want these to be established as release specifications for batch release for the product. Um, or you must provide an acceptable control strategy uh, that would obviate the need for um, a testing at release. So functions that are likely to be considered EPRs as applicable, accurate delivery, the delivery rate of the delivery time, the location of the delivery as defined by the needle depth, the force to activate, which could be an activation force like for an auto injector or an injection force um, like for a pre-filled syringe um, and break loose and glide force for a pre-filled syringe. And also they will ask that the end of delivery indication is likely to be considered an essential performance requirement, not necessarily for pre-filled syringe, but for those devices that have some sort of active delivery. Other functions that must be included as part of design verification, and, and these are only examples, are leakage, burst, connector compatibility, like with the IV spike or the lure, needle penetration force, adhesion for an on-body delivery system, OBDS, component separation force, closure removal force, like for a cap or a rigid needle shield or a tip cap, fragmentation when there's a puncture of a septum, the particles that may be generated by rubber particles, rubber particles that may be generated, and resealability for a multiple um, use or a multiple dose container closure so that it doesn't leak. Um, other functions and conditions testing for some SVPs, these are some, some just suggested standards for a pre-filled syringe. The ISO 11040-8 covers pre-filled syringes. The FDA guidance, which is not a really good guidance, but it has some requirements and expectations that FDA always will look to. For injector, the injectors, the ISO 11608 series, needle-based injection system, all sections. And these have been updated to be published very soon, if not already. For IV bags, there's an ISO standard. And uh, more recently for emergency use products like for uh, injectors that are going to deliver epinephrine and uh, naloxone, there is a guidance reliability for emergency use products that FDA has already put out. There are other standards and guidance documents that are included within these standards, including simulated shipping studies for ASTM and ISTA. So in addition to the testing expectation, there is an expect, there's the expectation that FDA has that you will meet usability requirements. The usability requirements they expect are already outlined in the guidance and their guidance and standards, which are human factor studies and related clinical study considerations, submissions for threshold analyses and human factor submissions um, for to drug and biologic applications and the IEC 62366-1 and-2, that's typo, studies for, um, that, that address human factors for, for medical devices. And information that you're going to be expected for clinical studies include a use-related risk assessment, which is a defined in those standards, in those guidance documents, a threshold analysis, which is defined in those guidance documents, and formative studies and justifications. 
for approval, you will have to make, you will have to have submit, you will be expected and requested to submit your summative, which is your validation protocol for human factors for review before the NDA. You will be required to provide su summative testing design validation um, performed prior to submission. Not, not perform, I'm sorry. Your design only performed prior to submission or in parallel with a pivotal clinical study. And the submission will require to be have a human factors usability engineering summary report and full validation study reports if the summary is not sufficiently detailed. In addition, the usability program must be supported by an appropriate program, which will have formative testing, some use related risk assessments, the validation plan, the engineering report, and a life cycle program. So all of that will be summarized, need to be summarized in the submission. In addition, usability in the USA has even become an issue for primary container closures and kits, so vials and kits. The Division of Medication Error and, and um, Risk Management, DEMEPA, is now the lead review for all combination product human factors. And they have, in addition to the human factors, have guidance document, uh, additional do uh, guidance documents on medication error on human factors requirements. And finally, some other challenges. Um, as I said before, the application of design controls to primary packaging, which is something that is inconsistent with those projects we are not truly designing a product. The application of how to address complex generic products where your delivery system has to be shown to be similar to the device constituent in order to be considered a generic product. Otherwise, it is a 505B2 or um, an NDA. Um, electronic products, software and cybersecurity, and connected devices, apps with standalone devices. So thank you for, uh, that was a very fast presentation covering a, a lot of information. And I know you will have questions and hopefully we have enough time to address those in the question and answer section. But just to summarize, the challenge to someone who is developing a small volume parenteral for, for um, <clears throat> approval in the US is not a small matter. It requires the understanding of new concepts implementation of new procedures, new systems, the interpretation of new requirements, and the ability to separate and test function as a completely separate program from the quality of the drug. So hopefully we can, I can address your questions at, um, at this point. Thank <music> you.